Well, hello everybody and welcome to another episode and well, we've got a bit of a mixed bag for you today. We're going to have a look at this beautiful little lens here. This is a lens from Practica. This is the 50mm f2.4 Practica and this is the, the little relation to the uh, better known Practica 50mm f1.8 this is the f2.4 it's a very nice lens we're also going to do a bit of a mailbag session where i answer some of your questions as well so a little bit of a mixed bag let's have a look first at this lovely little practica lens well now when it comes to vintage lenses there are cheap vintage lenses and there are very cheap vintage lenses and this one i'm glad to say falls into the latter category this is an astonishingly cheap vintage lens let me take it off the camera Ooh. this lens can be found for well the cheapest i've seen it advertised is 12 pounds the most expensive i've seen it advertised at is 30 pounds and that's just a stunning bargain it's a very high quality optic it's not particularly fast at f2.4 but how fast do you really need if you want to get started in vintage lenses this is a fantastic place to start if you've already got a collection of vintage lenses this is a great one to add to your collection let's have a closer look at this lens and the first thing you'll notice is how tiny it is this is really something of a pancake lens it's very very small just for comparison let's have a look at the Carl Zeiss Jena Tessar side by side and you can see that the Zeiss Jena lens is a larger lens in diameter and it's also a larger lens in length in fact it's probably about twice the length of the practicar so this practicar is a very very tiny lens indeed i'm not quite sure how they've managed to do it but it's a very very small lens even when the focus ring is fully extended it hardly extends at all so very small lens it's a very nicely made lens as well when I turn this focus ring it's beautifully smooth very very nice and smooth and the aperture ring is similarly smooth I think there are half stops on this lens and we go all the way from f2.4 at the wide end to f16 uh, with the aperture fully closed up. This one's in Practica PB mount and you can see there the electrical contacts. Of course that doesn't make any difference if you're using the lens on uh, a modern digital camera with an adapter then of course those electrical contacts don't do anything but if you're using them on one of the practical cameras a BC1 for example there's the uh, contacts where the uh, exposure information is transmitted so it's a bayonet mount the PB mount and you can get adapters for that mount to uh, Sony E mount, to Fuji X mount, and to all the well known other mounts too. So, a very nice little lens. So, it's a nicely made lens, it's a very small pancake lens, and it's also a really sharp lens too. That's helped by its not particularly fast maximum aperture of f2.4, but I think this is inherently a pretty sharp lens. It could well be a Tessar design. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that this lens is a Tessar design. It's said that 
The aperture of a Tessar design lens can't go any wider than f2.8. So if this is a Tessar, it may be that it's not quite f2.4 as advertised. Or it may be that the East German uh, Pentacon company back in the day found a way to make uh, a Tessar lens a little faster than f2.8. Who knows? But it's branded as F, marked as f2.4 and there we are so anyway back to the point it's a lens with really good inherent sharpness and it's going to delineate your subject very very clearly this is not a soft lens you can shoot this lens wide open and it retains its sharpness it does get sharper if you stop down uh, at f4 it's sharper and at f8 it's sharper still but i think there the sharpness advantage stops i don't think you get too much advantage beyond f8 but it is very very sharp at f8 as sharp as any lens uh, i could name so inherently a very sharp lens that's great if you like your images nice and sharp it gives really nice background blur as well. It's not the blurriest lens in the world, given that maximum aperture of f2.4, but it's not the least blurry lens in the world either. This lens will make a respectable amount of blur. If you go to the minimum focus distance, of course, that's where you'll get the most blur. If you go right up close on your subject, things in the distance will be highly blurred out. I do wonder about the minimum focus distance of this lens. It's marked as, what's it marked at? 0.6 of a meter, yes, yeah, 60 centimeters. But I'm not too sure it goes quite that close. I think it might be near a 0.7 or 0.8 of a meter. I could be completely wrong, but I just got that impression while I was shooting it Gosh, we're not getting quite as close here as we should do or we could do. But I might be completely wrong. Um, anyway, back to the point. The blur is very, very nice indeed. It's really soft. I couldn't find any point where it was particularly jarring or harsh. There are one or two vintage lenses that have a that give pretty harsh background blur at, at certain points. This doesn't seem to be one of them. It does seem to give nice, uniform, smooth blur. And at times, the blur is really nice. Sometimes, if you get the distances right, it just becomes delicious blur. You can see what I mean from these images. It's, it's just lovely. You could just fall into it. That's how soft and wonderful it is. So a very nice lens for blur. It's not a very high contrast lens. It's coated, of course, because it's a, a 70s, 80s, maybe even a 90s lens if they were made that long. Um, Multi-coated. It says MC on the front, but I can't see too much. Oh, no, there is coating on the back. It is a multi-coated lens, but anyway, it's not a very high contrast one. That can be a nice look, if you like that look. I, I do happen to like that look. I think it gives a lovely, delicate sort of feel to images. Um, also, it doesn't respond too well to light sources in the frame. If you do get a light source in the frame, even you know a fairly washed out light source, not even a direct light source, you can get a lessening of contrast and that happens pretty readily with this lens now you have to have a direct light source in the frame for the lens to wash out completely but with an indirect light source in the frame it will still wash out to some extent and that gives you the most beautiful the most delicate lovely images you could imagine so that's an example of where a flaw really becomes a benefit. I love what, what the lens does when it just partially washes out. I think it's really nice. If it's not to your taste, just put a hood on it. Um, I'm not sure what the filter size is on here. It looks like a 55mm or a 49mm. 
Um, but yeah, just stick a stick a hood on it if uh, if if you like if you prefer the higher contrast look. So this is a great all-purpose everyday lens. It's very small. It's very light. It's very handy. It doesn't make your camera too big, even with an adapter on that camera, which you'll need if you're shooting mirrorless. And it makes some great images too. So a real nice all-rounder of a lens. Very cheap, 12 to 30 pounds. You'll probably get it cheaper if you're patient and uh, if you're, uh, you know, if you keep looking. Obvious rivals, well, the most obvious rival is perhaps this one, the Carl Zeiss Jena Tessar 50mm 2.8. But I could also list the Indostar 61, that's another Tessar lens, uh, f2.8 50mm, uh, the Indostar 26, uh, the Helios 44. Uh, both the Indostars, by the way, those lenses go for around £10 or even less. The Helios 44 goes for around 30 to 40 maybe £50. Also, the Jupiter 8 um, is, is perhaps uh, a rival for this lens. That's a little more expensive than these two. Uh, comes in around 30 to £40, Jupiter 8 50mm f2. Um, but yeah, a really nice lens, very cheap, uh, lots of them about, very available, very small, very light, and I've really enjoyed using it. I didn't know this lens existed, and now that I've found it, I'm really glad I've found it, because this is another lens in that list of super cheap, very high quality uh, lenses from the former Iron Curtain countries, so a lovely little thing. Grab one today, they're too cheap not to. So, mailbag, let's have a look at some of the questions and comments that you have sent in. So, first of all, Sarmatico says, Thank you for the video, this inspired me to try some of the old lenses, Jupiter 9, Jupiter 11, Indostar 50 and 61, Mir 1 Helios 44 Zebra that my grandfather used on his cameras. And I'm going to try them on a new mirrorless base. I'll probably pick up something like the next 5 or the next 3N as a base. Well, now I thought this was interesting because it shows very clearly just how cheaply you can get started using vintage lenses on mirrorless cameras. All of the lenses that Sarmatico mentions, apart perhaps from the Mir 1, can be found for less than £50. And some of them, the Jupiter 11, the Indostar 50, the Indostar 61, can be found very, very cheaply indeed for, gosh, Certainly in the case of the Indostar 50 and 61, around £10. Jupiter 11, maybe 20 to £30. And a cheap mirrorless camera, a cheap used mirrorless camera like the Sony Nex 5 or the Sony Nex 3. Gosh, what are we talking for those? £100 at the very most. So you could be up and running with, I don't know, two or three vintage lenses and an older used mirrorless camera like the Nex5 or the Nex3 for around £150 and that's very very cheap photography so you really can get started extremely cheaply in mirrorless photography and uh, especially if you want to use vintage lenses so I thought that was really interesting and I'm really glad that Sarmatico has brought out these old lenses of his grandfather's and reused them because otherwise what's going to happen they're just going to molder in the loft or in storage somewhere they're going to get moldy they're going to get dirty and eventually there won't be any use whatsoever so it's really great that they've been brought back into service and pressed back into use thanks for that Sarmatico. the next comment uh, question in fact comes from dynamax Hi, says Dynamax. Thank you for this video. Pent is the Pentacon 50mm 1.8 lens radioactive? Well, no, it isn't. I don't think any of the 
um, Pentacon lenses. Pentacon 51.8s are radioactive. They did make them in a bewildering variety of guises and appearances. And there was also the um, Maya Optic 50mm f1.8 that the Pentacon, in fact, was based on. And I don't think that was radioactive either. So, as I understand it, do correct me if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, I don't think any of the Pentacon lenses were radioactive at all. The only former iron curtain lens that I can think of that I know uh, for pretty much for certain was radioactive, and I say pretty much because there is doubt on all these points. These are very old lenses now. They were designed in the 40s, 50s, 60s, um, and so it's difficult to find information. But I'm pretty sure uh, that the only, um, or rather, the only iron curtain, former iron curtain lens that I'm pretty sure was radioactive is the early version of the Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola 50mm 1.8. That is the Zebra version. The later version, the MC multi-coated version, is not radioactive. As far as Pentacon go, I don't think any of their lenses are radioactive at all, and certainly not the 50 1.8. Mihai Serbanescu says, I got a Tokina 135 f2.8 for 10 quid, a Helios 44M for 13 quid, and a Carl Zeiss Jena P 50mm f1.8, also for 13 quid. I'm not sure if I did well or not, but I can't wait for the adapters to arrive to try them out. Well, Mihai, you certainly did do well. The Carl Zeiss Jena Pancola that you got there, which is, I think, the lens you're talking about, the 51.8, you bought that for £13. Well, the usual price for one of those is around about £150, so you certainly did well there. Tokina 135 for a tenner, that's about right. Helios 44M for £13. Well, those are those usually go for around £30 to £40, so that's a score that was a score as well. Um all of those are really nice lenses and Mihai's proved the point there that if you look carefully, you can find the bargains. The bargains are out there, as I've always said. Sometimes um, people write in to say, oh gosh, where do you find your lenses? Can't find any at that price. You've got to be patient or lucky, most likely patient. Um, but the bargains are out there. Um, and all of those lenses in the list uh, that Mihai sent. All of those lenses have a vital ingredient that modern lenses don't have, or not to the same extent anyway, and that is character. So, you know, whether you paid full price for them or whether you didn't, you didn't in this case, but even if you did, it's still a score because those lenses will make images that modern lenses just can't. So, many, many cheap lenses out there for less than the cost of a pizza. And that's pretty cool. Well done, Mihai, on your finds. Jean-Pierre Doni says, Hello, I just bought an XE1. I bought one in 2014 with the 18-55. And I bought a Fuji M-mount adapter ring to use my Leica 50mm f2 and Zeiss 35mm f2 lenses. What do you think of this association and what do you think of the Samyang MF85 F1.4 Fuji mount? Well, the Samyang I can't comment on. Um, the Leica 50mm F2, well, I have a Summitar 50mm F2 and it works really nicely on all of the Fuji cameras that I've had. The Sommitar is not the sharpest lens in the pack, wide open, but it does have a beautiful signature in terms of colour and in terms of blur and in terms of an undefinable feel. Some lenses do have an undefinable feel, 
and certainly my Summitar has that. I'm not quite sure if that's the same lens that Jean-Pierre is talking about, but whichever Leica 50 f2 you've got is going to work just fine on your xe1 and the same with your zeiss 35 mil f2 it's going to work just fine and it's going to make you some nice images finally jean pierre also asks how should the focus mode selector be set to s c or m with a manual lens well of course it should be set to m m for manual uh, and on all the Fuji cameras, there is a little control, usually here at the bottom left of the camera, your bottom right, screen bottom right as you're looking at it now. Uh, it's a rotary control and it's got S for single autofocus, C for continuous autofocus and M for manual focus. And of course you should set it to manual focus if you're using vintage lenses on a Fuji digital camera and also don't forget if you're using vintage lenses you've also got to set the camera to something like release without lens or shoot without lens something of that sort in the menu otherwise your camera won't fire so thanks to Jean-Pierre for that uh, comment Hedy Slimane says love your videos thank you Hedy I've learned so much from watching them I recently purchased a Helios 44-2, one of my favourite lenses, and when adapted to Pentax K-mount on my Vivitar V335, that is a film SLR, I have issues focusing to infinity. I don't have any M42 screw mount SLRs, so I'm unsure if this is due to the adapter or the lens. Would you happen to know which it might be? Well. Without seeing the actual setup, of course, I, I, I can't immediately say which it might be, but I would suspect the lens. If you have a good quality adapter, Eddie, uh, that is a good quality uh, M42 to K-mount adapter, I would suspect the lens may be at fault, but there is an easy way to test it. Um, if you have any other M42 lenses, simply put them onto your Pentax camera with the adapter. And then if that lens doesn't focus, you know that the adapter is at fault. If that lens does focus, then you know that the lens is at fault. So I think that's the best way I could think of. Uh, of diagnosing that problem. Usually when you get a lens that won't focus properly on an adapter, whether you're using it on digital mirrorless or whether you're adapting um, uh, an SLR lens from a different mount to an SLR, usually I would say the lens is at fault. It's very difficult for an adapter to be at, uh, an adapter to be at fault unless it's been made wrongly. All an adapter is, is a metal tube of the right length with the right mounts at each end. And if that adapter is the right length and your lenses will go on and the adapter will go onto the camera, there really can't be anything other wrong with it. The only exception to that is if the adapter has a focusing element built into it. So if you're adapting Nikon lenses to uh, uh, a film SLR then they always have to have um, an extra optical element built into that adapter because of the nature of the uh, Nikon film SLRs so if you're using an adapter of that kind then the adapter could be at fault but if it's just a straight through uh, simple metal tube then almost certainly the lens is at fault GH Picard says and this is in reference to an episode from a couple of weeks ago where I, when I was wondering whether to keep my Carl Zeiss Jena Flectagon vintage lens or a nice new or newish anyway Sonar 35mm Zeiss uh, f2.8 autofocus lens GH Bicard says I think you should keep the Fleck Beside it having more character, by the moment the flexible printed circuits and motor 
in the sun our guts get tired which could be in not much time depending on the hours you put on it the fleck would only need just a CLA to keep delivering and in fact the overwhelming response that I got um, when I asked the question which one should I keep the sonar or the fleck the overwhelming response was to keep the flectagon and in fact that's what I've done because I've had that flectagon for so many years that I just couldn't sell it it's such a versatile lens it's been such a useful lens to me apart from liking the lens for its nature and character it's really useful as well and if I got rid of it it would leave a real hole in my lens collection so I decided to sell on the sonar that is now with a new owner and uh, I do hope it's bringing that owner pleasure but yeah I've kept the fleck and the point that GH Picard makes is a really valid one because the electronics all right modern electronics are very long lasting there's no doubt about it but they can wear out inside the sonar there are motors there are gears there are all sorts of little mechanisms and sensors and this that and the other that can go wrong inside a vintage lens like the flectagon there's very very little to go wrong there's the aperture mechanism and the focus mechanism so if you want longevity uh, I really do think that uh, vintage is the way to go so thanks GH Picard for that comment Eddie asks a very simple question what camera do you use well almost always for most of the shots for the overwhelming majority of shots on this channel I use one of these this is a Sony a7 in fact it, this is the Sony a7R this will be moved on fairly soon I'll be going back to my Sony a7 uh, but yeah I use the full frame Sony a7 for the overwhelming majority of vintage lens shots on this channel sometimes I use my Fujifilm X-T3 to test vintage lenses or to test lenses that have only a Fuji mount but where I do that I'll make it clear and I'll, I'll let you know so the camera that I use for almost all the images on the channel is this one the full frame Sony a7 so you know that when you look at those images you're seeing the full image circle that the lens can give I'm not using a crop sensor camera you're seeing exactly what the lens was designed to do uh, in the 35 mil film days so uh, yeah Sony a7 full frame almost all the images on the channel Wolfgang Wust says slightly off topic could you tell us about your video setup on this clip and I think Wolfgang is referring to a recent episode I made outside I do like to get out when I can it changes the scenery around and the perfect camera to do it with the perfect video camera to do that with is this lovely little thing this is the DJI Osmo pocket and it's a little gimbal camera it's a tiny tiny little thing and in fact I will be doing an episode on this camera shortly but yeah all of my outside videos I make with this lovely little video camera it can shoot in 4k it can shoot at 24 frames a second uh, it can shoot in a flat profile if you want to grade it afterwards to avoid blowing out and clipping or it can shoot in an auto profile to make everything easy and whack the color up a little bit it's just a great little camera and for impromptu filmmaking for vlogging things like that I don't know any better camera it's just fantastic so I will be doing a video on this little camera fairly shortly but that is what I use to do my outside videos with and it's a great little machine so channel news well I did put out a poll recently asking about whether you thought I should start a new channel to include different things to photography photography related items 
um, what kind of things you'd be happy seeing on the channel. Um, various questions I asked. So I got loads of responses from that. So thanks to everybody who fed back to me uh, in that poll. I am considering making some changes to the channel and I am considering possibly going to one video every two weeks rather than every week. That might be a change that I need to make um, simply because of the time involved in, in, in making these videos really. There is no way this channel is stopping. I'm very, very pleased with the way that this channel has developed and I'm, you know, I do feel a sense of achievement from it. So I'm, I'm really happy with it and, and it's really become something of a constant companion to my life, uh, really. So there is no way that this channel is stopping, but I may go to one video every two weeks simply because of the time involved in making them. It takes me many 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 hours of work to make one of these videos most of my evenings and weekends are used up doing the videos and i'm just gonna have to rethink how i use my time what's my best way to use my time to make really high quality material um, for you guys to see so that may be a change that is coming up in the future i don't know we'll see but many thanks to everybody who responded to the poll so that is it from me for this week let me take this opportunity to once again thank all of the subscribers subscribers old subscribers new people who come back to the channel again and again people who've decided it's worth clicking that button to say yes I actually like what this channel is offering so thank you so much for that subscribers thank you many many thanks also to the patrons that support the channel over on patreon patrons old patrons new patrons who've been with us forever patrons who've just joined and have decided again yeah this is worth supporting it's because of that support that I can continue to make these videos, continue to bring you the gear reviews that uh, that I do. So many, many thanks to all of the patrons. And if you enjoy the content on this channel, why not consider becoming a patron yourself over at patreon.com forward slash xenography. So I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the jolly old bell before you go. That's it from me for this time. I will see you next time for some more xenography. <laughs>